large-scale battles, vehicular combat, amazing gunplay. The mere fact it's not Call of Duty. Battlefield games are played for a number of reasons, but it's up to each player to find their own. With the next entry in the Battlefield series scheduled for a 2021 release, I figured I'd go back and review some of the Battlefield games that I've played. And what better way to start this journey than with the very first Battlefield game that I ever played. Battlefield Bad Company is a very unique entry into the Battlefield series. It was the second Battlefield game developed exclusively for consoles, and was the first Battlefield game to have a proper campaign. Although this wasn't the first time a single player campaign was developed, with Bad Company the campaign felt more proper, with things such as established characters that you could connect with instead of just their name being passively mentioned, and a personalized story rather than a general one, to give two examples of improvement. People to this day praise this game for its excellent story, great characters, great multiplayer, and more. Having gone back and played this game, it was definitely nice to satisfy my nostalgia, and I sure as hell got a great level of enjoyment from revisiting the game that got me into the Battlefield series. That being said though, in replaying this game, I do have to admit, some aspects of the game have not aged very well. We'll get onto those details later. For now though, let's begin with what Bad Company is known for to this day, the writing and the story. Battlefield Bad Company has you taking on the role of Private Preston Marlowe, a soldier in the US Army who got transferred to B Company, aka Bad Company, a unit in the army that is deemed as expendable and cannon fodder. Basically, B Company is made up of soldiers that either decided or were given military service in this unit instead of jail time after they did something bad in their previous unit. Marlowe found himself in this unit after some particular incident involving a helicopter, and finds himself joining up with three other soldiers in this new unit to form the four-man squad. Sarge, Sweetwater, and Haggard. Sarge is your typical squad leader that doesn't like to mess around, and is characterized by being always so close to retirement, but something always comes up just as he's about to leave. Weren't you supposed to be shipping home about now, Sarge? Tomorrow, Haggard. One more day of this shit, and the only thing I'm gonna be fighting a blue mark. Yeah, I hear you, Sarge. Next up, the Caribbean. Well, after Zabograd. Zabograd a ding dong! Sweetwater is the nerd of the squad, who always likes to dish out information about various things, to the point where he tends to be the guy who's told to shut up a lot of the time. This is our stop. Eyes open, okay? And Sweetwater, just shut up. What? I didn't say anything. What you just did. That's not fair. I know you are, but what am shut I? Shut up! Haggard is the guy who loves anything related to demolitions and explosives, and is the kind of guy who is very expressive in his emotions, whatever the circumstances may be. And Marlo, he, he, um, I'm gonna be honest, Marlo has about as much personality as a cardboard box. Yeah, upon replaying this game, Marlo doesn't have a lot to add to the table in terms of personality. The best that I can say about him is that he's the new guy and is therefore often the one to be asked to do all the heavy lifting. Other than that, he doesn't have anything that makes him stand out from the others. He's just your average, let's get this done kind of guy. It also doesn't help that Marlo is one of the protagonists who speaks during cutscenes, but not during gameplay. I'll never understand why games like to do this. Silent protagonists aren't a bad thing. Games have proven time and time again that they can work, and at this point in gaming, whenever we come across one, we just accept it and move on. 
But when the game adds the ability for them to speak during the cinematics, then they're no longer a true silent protagonist. Despite my gripes about Marlo's bland personality and the choices made for when he speaks, Bad Company manages to pull off the unthinkable given the circumstances. Sarge, Sweetwater, and Haggard are all so memorable and well-written that I found myself ignoring Marlo's bland personality. While it would have definitely been nice to have Marlo join in on the conversations the squad has during gameplay, hearing the three others banter with one another provided some interesting listening along with some good laughs. Mostly good laughs, though. Big ugly flashlight. She drops a big ugly flashlight. Why did she drop this? It's a laser designator, meathead. You use it to guide in airstrikes. <laughs> Holy mother of a cow! Now I feel a itsy bitsy stupid for calling it a big ugly flashlight. Wow! This is an actual palace! It's like a, um... Versailles? No. Buckingham Palace? No! Disneyland? What's it called? Xanadu. Acta non verba. That's the Legionnaire's motto. It's Latin and it means action, not words. Hang on, I was at the Taco Emporium. I think you'll find that Spanish. I'll just shut up. The yo motto should be verba non acta, cause you never shut the hell up. Let's get out of here. One thing that I noticed is that the plot itself is very lighthearted when it comes to military FPS games. By this point, I'm so used to these kinds of settings having deep plots, or at least plots that take on a much more serious role. And don't get me wrong, I do love plots that have serious tones, regardless of the genre. When done right, these kinds of stories can have every kind of emotion to them. From happiness, to anger, to excitement, to sadness, having the player hooked, enabling them to get lost in the game's world, and just so much more. But I also like plots that allow me to have some good laughs in there too. Sometimes I want a plot that's lighthearted, funny, and awe-inspiring, especially since the real life world... 90% <sighs> of things in the real life world suck. So it's nice to be able to get something like Bad Company Story where, despite it being in a war setting, you can still play the game and count on there being plenty of laughs on a consistent basis along the journey. But back to the story. The four of you are out and about performing tasks to help the war effort against the Russians in Europe when you come across a mercenary group, the Legionnaires. After discovering these mercs were paid in gold bars, well... It then becomes a story of finding tooth and nail to get the gold so you can all be rich and ditch the war. Where did the hackers go? There's gold in them hills! Shit, that's a neutral zone. Hacker, fall back! He can't hear you, Sarge. If he could, he wouldn't listen. Overall, Bad Company has an excellent story to it that is ranked among the top compared to other entries. Nowadays, it's a cliche to have modern-day Battlefield campaigns suck, so to go back and play a Battlefield game where the campaign was not just good, but excellent, was very refreshing to see. Alright, now let's talk about gameplay. This is unfortunately where I'm going to be a bit more critical towards the game, as while it's a fun one to play, and there are great things about it, it definitely shows that this game was from 2008. For starters, rather than having the campaign be on a linear path with little exploration available, the game opts to allow a semi-open world. I say semi-open world because while you are able to explore parts of the map that aren't related to the objective at that present moment, it's very limited. You still have sections of the map blocked off until you complete a primary objective or two, and oftentimes the only thing that'll be at these little side areas are a weapon or two and maybe a piece of equipment or two. Don't get me wrong though, sometimes the exploration pays off. For example, a piece of equipment you found from doing some exploring can enable you to clear a level more easily than if you just stuck to the beaten path. But oftentimes, it's something as simple as just another weapon. I do have to give Bad Company some leniency on this though, as I think at this time they wanted to test the waters regarding the open map aspect of it all. That, and nothing about the exploration hampers the gameplay experience, that's the big thing. Nothing counted against the gameplay experience if you did go off the beaten path, which is why I am giving this some leniency. 
Some people have compared this to the game bringing the multiplayer experience over to the single player. Well, I don't think that was the intention, seeing as how Bad Company's multiplayer features only rush mode, which is more linear. Comparing it to other Battlefield games today with large-scale battles and modes like Conquest, then I can definitely see the comparison. Though, one aspect that does feel inspired from multiplayer is the respawning mechanic. When you die during Bad Company's campaign, rather than restarting from a previous checkpoint, you instead respawn close to where you died and continue from there. Any destruction you caused remains, any enemies you killed beforehand stays dead, any action you did prior remains. It felt a little weird going through this the few times I died during my playthrough, I'm not gonna lie, but it doesn't hamper the gameplay experience. At no point did I find myself in like a horrendous cycle of needing to essentially do trial and error or chip away at an enemy vehicle's health per life, nothing like that. It's more surprising to see instead of something that I consider to be wrong with the game, especially since most games today use the respawn at checkpoint method instead for their single player content. As for the gunplay, the best way that I can describe it is stiff. Going from games that have me fluently turning to aim, firing my weapon, crouching, things like that, to this game where those actions don't happen as fluently was definitely quite an adjustment. Those of you who have played the game before and compared it to how FPS games today feel will know what I mean when I say that this game is less smooth and more stiff. For those of you who haven't though, let me see if this comparison will help. Here's gameplay of Battlefield 4. Here's gameplay of Bad Company. Next on the move. Hassanan, Ikda alayhim! Did you notice how in the Battlefield 4 footage things happened more naturally looking? That's what I mean. This means that the gunfights have a bit of a clunky feeling to them in Bad Company. Not enough to break the game or have me throw my hands in the air and defeat over it, but it's noticeable. Enemies have a bit more health to them along with increased bullet spread at longer distances, which is why you'll see weapons such as assault rifles or SMGs have sometimes twice their normal ammo count to compensate. Speaking of those weapons, what do we have? We have assault rifles, SMGs, LMGs, shotguns, sniper rifles, sidearms, and miscellaneous, such as the famous grenade launcher, normal grenades, rocket launchers, laser designators, and more. Though oddly enough, there is an instance or two of a weapon that seems to belong in one category being in another here. Like the SCAR. It's an assault rifle, but behaves like an SMG in this game. It's a small little thing to nitpick at, but it's something that I noticed. What isn't a small little thing to nitpick at though, is how the game goes about with storing your inventory. At any point, you have your primary weapon, some sort of secondary attachment or equipment, your auto injector, and then any other piece of equipment that you found, such as a laser designator, motion sensor, etc. For example, when you have an assault rifle with a grenade launcher, you have that assault rifle, and then as your quote unquote secondary weapon, you have your grenade launcher. No pistol, no rocket launcher, nothing like that. Then in your equipment side, you may have your auto injector and then a rocket launcher, or your auto injector and your laser designator, or your auto injector and your repair tool. For the SMG-like weapons, you'll have your primary weapon and then a standard hand grenade. No sort of secondary weapon. This, I don't know how to feel, because on the one hand, I found that it didn't hurt the gameplay experience, but it's just an odd design choice to not have a true secondary weapon outside of when you're using the sniper rifle, where you get your sniper rifle and then a genuine sidearm. 
I've seen other people complain about this. Me personally, it wasn't a deal breaker, more so just an odd choice that I'm gonna have to chalk up to aging. Thankfully, in games like Bad Company 2 in the future, you would have secondary weapons along with your equipment being better mapped out on a controller or PC. Speaking of those weapons in this game though, you're able to use any and all weapons and equipment to lay waste to your enemies, be it engaging in regular firefights with your standard assault rifle, to obliterating the side of a house with your grenade launcher or rocket launcher, to calling in airstrikes on heavy armor. This serves as an excellent transition to another thing Bad Company's campaign does well, variety. The game leaves it entirely up to the player on how they want to proceed. Does the player want to rely on their vehicle, opting to take the repair tool as their equipment piece? Does the player want to keep the rocket launcher for the next vehicle encounter on foot? Does the player want to grab the almighty laser designator to call in airstrikes from afar and then move in to mop up the stragglers? Players can do all of that and more in bad company, and it was really nice to be able to approach the objective however I wanted. My tactic personally was charging in through the front gate with a vehicle or staying back to destroy any enemy vehicles with airstrikes where I could before charging in to take care of the infantry. Another thing I do have to give bad company credit for is in its length. While I remember the campaign being longer, upon finishing it, I was surprised to see only 7 missions in the list. The game makes up for there being only 7 missions with having each one lean on the longer side in terms of length. I completed the game in around 6 hours, with the length being extended a bit for those playing on the harder difficulties. Bad Company's campaign was really fun to return to, despite it showing its age in a couple of areas regarding the gameplay. However, Bad Company's campaign still remains strong. The freedom the game gives the player in how they want to proceed, coupled with some excellent characters to accompany the player for their journey, and a little bit of leniency given how old this game is, and Bad Company single player is still a very solid experience to this day. Bad Company's multiplayer is in the same boat, where it's a lot of fun to play, but it has definitely aged. The main thing is that if you can get over that game's age, then the multiplayer is capable of being great fun. For starters, the same core gameplay from the campaign is brought over into the multiplayer. Nearly everything on the map is destructible. While no buildings are able to collapse in this game, the walls that protect troops inside can be blasted away with explosives, providing more line of sight opportunities and or denying the enemy the use of cover. The weapons and equipment in the campaign act just like in the multiplayer aside from some very minor changes to equipment such as, for instance, the health injector gradually replenishing your health instead of it being instant. Some weapons and equipment are locked behind unlock points that you earn naturally through gameplay, giving the multiplayer some progression outside of just ranking up. In the multiplayer, there are five different classes to choose from. Assault, Demolition, Recon, Specialist, and Support. Assault is your standard all-round class armed with assault rifles, 40mm grenade launchers, and either a regular grenade or auto-injector to replenish health. They're the standard infantry-focused class. Demolitions are armed with shotguns for close-range firefights and either rocket launchers or AT mines to fulfill the anti-vehicle role. Recon are the snipers, able to take on long-range engagements along with spotting enemies with motion sensors or using the ever-powerful laser designator. Specialists are also close quarter soldiers fitted with SMG-like weapons. They can fire off tracer darts for the demolition players to lock onto vehicles, along with some grenades and the ever fun to use C4. And lastly, support, armed with LMGs along with health packs to heal allies along with a mortar strike and power tool. Battlefield has always made sure to properly balance its classes based on their distinct abilities, and here it's no different. The balance is near perfect. Assault troops are great for infantry combat, demolitions whip out the rocket launchers or AT mines when a vehicle is on the approach, 
Specialists have fun with C4 no matter what they're blowing up. And in general, no class feels too powerful or too weak. There's no one class that can do everything and no one class that can't do anything. Teamwork and coordination is needed with the other teammates playing as the other classes in order to effectively win the day per match. However, I do have to admit, as much fun as playing this game was, it was a little infuriating at times realizing just how much this game has aged. Things we take for granted nowadays, like more than one game mode, vehicles that control good. Seriously, who developed the controls for the helicopter and multiplayer? Parachutes, decent at best connection quality. Friendly fire being turned off for the core game modes, which means in this game, people who just want to troll your team can drain your reinforcements if you're the attacker thanks to all the team killing that they're doing, and more were all noticeable during my time playing. Like I said though, most of these things are a result of aging, so comparing today's standards to back then would be a bit unfair. But it does still invite the moments of frustration when playing. We lost Gold Crate 1. Gold Crate 2 is under attack. Someone take out this sniper. How does Rush Mode play itself though? For those of you unaware of what Rush Mode is, Rush Mode is an attacker versus defender game mode. Attackers are tasked with destroying two crates full of gold per sector of the map until they destroy all the crates, and the defenders have to defend those crates and drain the attackers' as reinforcements down to zero. Each side gains access to a variety of vehicles and turret emplacements per sector of the map, or sometimes it's just infantry combat for a sector or two. Bad Company's rush mode isn't as large in scope as one may think, given when this game came out combined with it being released for consoles, not PC. Rush mode is a 6v6 mode featuring linear maps given the nature of the game mode, so combat may have multiple infantry and vehicles fighting one another, but in a more condensed size. The different lines of sight, paths, and vehicles all allow for different classes in the game to find their own ways to shine, which is great. The different vehicles in the game have their own strengths and weaknesses too, which balances them nicely. Tanks are beefy, heavy machines, but if they find themselves trapped in a close quarters fight or swarmed with anti-tank troops, they're in trouble. Helicopters are able to rain down powerful fire onto the enemy, but have to watch for AA emplacements and get used to this game's multiplayer helicopter controls. Jeeps are great for moving troops from one zone to the next and more. From what I was able to gather during my playtime, I didn't come across a map that seemed to favor the attacker or defender. The only instances of one side wiping the floor with the other that I found is when either my team or the enemy's team was in complete disarray. Otherwise, it was mostly a fair fight all round. I say mostly because during my playtime, I found that the crates could be too easily destroyed with vehicles. Most of the matches I played had players firing at the crates using tanks or LAVs if they could rather than going to the crates themselves and arming the charges. The fact players are using alternate means to destroy the objectives isn't the issue. What I have an issue with is in how easily it seems that the players can do that. I don't think the crates should be indestructible to other means of firepower, but I at least think they should not lose all of their health after just a few bursts of cannon fire from an LAV. If the game had either reduced the damage that vehicles do to the crates or just have the health pool slightly buffed to compensate for that, then I think the game would have been good in that regard. Speaking of Rush, as I mentioned earlier, that's the only game mode that we have here. No conquest, no team deathmatch, nothing else. I know that for some people Rush mode is their favorite mode, and most Battlefield players tend to stick with their one favorite mode most of the time. I'm guilty of this too, most of my time on any Battlefield game nowadays is conquest. However, I do like some variety in my game modes. I played Obliteration from Battlefield 4 a bunch during the game's opening months, and Carrier Assault was also loads of fun when the DLC for that dropped. Battlefield 1, Operations Mode, while infuriating at times, looking at you Monte Grappa, was also loads of fun. It's good to have variety in games, so to play a game that has just this one game mode was a little jarring. This one I can't chalk up to age, as other games from this era, and hell even earlier Battlefield games, have had multiple game modes. Thankfully, Rush itself is overall loads of fun, but it does kind of feel empty with that being the only game mode here. 
Just like with the single player, if players can get over that hurdle of experiencing just how much this game has aged, then the multiplayer for this game can be loads of fun too. Overall, I'm glad that I went back and revisited this game, even if nowadays I can spot the areas where the game screams that it was made in 2008. Not only does the game have a great campaign with memorable characters, introducing the series to the now commonplace feature of destruction, and fun multiplayer to name a few examples, but it also has a special place in my heart. As I stated in the beginning, Bad Company was my very first Battlefield game that I played, and is what introduced me to the series as a whole. After this game, I played Bad Company 2, then Battlefield 3, then Battlefield 4, and so on. So I must also say thank you to Bad Company and the developers behind it. Thank you for making me a Battlefield fan. And that'll do it for this review, everyone. What do you think of Battlefield Bad Company? Do you like it and love it as much as I do? Do you dislike it or hate it for one reason or another? What do you think? Let's get a little discussion going on in the comments here. With that being said, thank you all for watching. I hope you enjoyed. If you did, make sure to leave a like, drop a comment, and if you really want to, you can hit the subscribe button and be sure to click that bell icon to receive notifications for all future uploads. And until next time, stay safe, stay healthy, and peace out. Great job, guys.